nine and a half hour launch count. These planned holds give our team additional time to resolve any issues that come up prior to entering terminal count. At the request of our customer, today's live coverage will conclude following payload fairing jettison scheduled to occur about six and a half minutes after liftoff. In addition to watching our webcast, you can follow live mission progress at ULALaunch.com. Will Ulrich, the 45th Space Wings Launch Weather Officer, recently briefed the team on weather conditions here at Cape Canaveral. The probability of violating launch constraints is 10%. Ground winds are 5 to 10 knots out of the southwest, and the temperature is 81 degrees Fahrenheit. So, the weather is within launch commit criteria and looks favorable for our planned T0 at 2.04 a.m. Eastern. Today's flight will take an easterly heading away from our Cape Canaveral launch pad. Let's take a look at what else we can expect to see this morning. And liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy rocket. At T minus 14 seconds, the Rofis, which look like sparklers, ignite to burn off excess hydrogen injected into the flame duct. Rofi ignition is followed by ignition of the starboard Delta IV RS-68A engine at T minus seven seconds. Two seconds later, the center and port RS-68A engines ignite, generating more than 2.1 million pounds of total thrust to lift the rocket off the pad. This staggered engine start mitigates the fireball created by the hydrogen burning Delta IV Heavy. Shortly after liftoff, Delta IV begins a pitch over to attain the proper flight path while minimizing the pressure the vehicle experiences during flight. The Delta IV reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound, at 1 minute 18 seconds. Two seconds later, the rocket experiences maximum dynamic pressure as it travels through Earth's atmosphere. At 3 minutes 56 seconds, the port and starboard booster engine shut down. Two seconds later, the port and starboard boosters are jettisoned. The center booster engine then throttles to full power to maximize performance. Approaching main engine cutoff, Delta IV is traveling at more than 24,753 kilometers, or 15,381 miles per hour, is located 111 kilometers, or 69 miles in altitude, and is 586 kilometers, or 364 miles downrange. At 5 minutes 36 seconds, propellant levels deplete and the booster engine shuts down. Seven seconds later, Delta IV separation system activates to release the first stage. The vehicle now weighs a little more than 5% of what it did at liftoff. At 5 minutes 56 seconds, the Delta cryogenic second stage main engine burn begins. During ascent, NROL-44 is protected inside a 5-meter diameter tri-sector payload fairing. At approximately 6 minutes 38 seconds, the payload fairing is jettisoned. Delta IV continues its national security mission following payload fairing jettison. ULA is using the Delta IV Heavy configuration to launch the NROL-44 mission. This is the 12th Delta IV Heavy launch and ULA's 141st mission. Delta IV Heavy is built in Decatur, Alabama, and it's our largest, most powerful configuration. It's comprised of three common booster cores, each powered by Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-68A engines, and a Delta Cryogenic second stage powerjet powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10B2 engine. It's equipped with a 5-meter payload fairing, which you can see here. Events began July 27th when the spacecraft, encapsulated inside that payload fairing, was transported to the mobile service tower at Space Launch Complex 37 and vertically integrated to the Delta Heavy rocket. About 6.30 p.m. last night, final preps began. The Delta mobile service tower is 300 feet tall, 100 feet wide, and 100 feet long, making it as tall as a football field is long as, and as wide as a basketball court. It weighs about 10 million pounds. There are 40 hydraulic cylinders at pressures nearing 3,500 PSI that raise the MST eight inches prior to moving it back to its park position. The MST uses a carriage transporter system that travels about a quarter mile per hour and takes about 25 minutes to roll the MST to the launch position 345 feet north of the launch vehicle. Delta IV stands 235 feet tall or about 23 stories and weighs about 1.6 million pounds fully fueled. 
The three big RS-68A engines produced more than 2 million pounds of thrust at liftoff. Today's launch is for the National Reconnaissance Office, or NRO. This is ULA's 29th launch for the NRO and the 8th use of the Delta IV Heavy for the NRO. The NRO is a joint organization engaged in the research, development, acquisition, launch, and operation of innovative overhead reconnaissance systems necessary to meet the needs of the intelligence community and the Department of Defense. The NRO is recognized for its transformational intelligence collection systems that are used to develop highly accurate military targeting data, support international peacekeeping and humanitarian relief operations, and to assess the impact of natural disasters. Earlier this week, we had the chance to hear from the L-44 trajectory engineer, Corey Buckingham. Let's take a look at what he mentions is unique about the Delta IV Heavy and today's flight. Hi, my name is Corey Buckingham. I'm the trajectory engineer for the L-44 mission. There's a few reasons the Delta IV Heavy is the only vehicle that can launch the L-44 payload. Primarily, it's the payload fairing. The ULA payload fairing is 65 feet long and 5 meters in diameter. That's about 16 and a half feet. And it provides sufficient payload volume capacity for the L-44 satellite. The performance capability is the combined performance of the first stage and the second stage. As you can clearly see, there are three boosters that provide over 2 million pounds of thrust to lift the vehicle off the pad. It's going to be a brilliant show. I can't wait to see it. Now talking about the second stage, the DCSS, the Delta Cryogenic Second Stage, is a very capable and highly performing second stage. A big contributor to the second stage performance is the extendable nozzle of the DCSS. We launched the mission with the nozzle in the stowed position and then after booster jettison, the nozzle deployment system extends the nozzle to its full length. This very long nozzle is a huge performance increase because of the increase of, in ISP, specific impulse. ISP is how we measure the efficiency of a rocket engine. It is calculated as thrust divided by the flow rate of the propellants. A great way to think about ISP is related to your car. Uh, your car's engine, the efficiency is measured in miles per gallon. It's, it's a very similar concept with rocket engines and the high ISP allowed for by the extendable nozzle of the RL-10 allows us to achieve the orbit of the L-44 payload. So if you're looking for someone to blame for the very early launch time, you can blame me. I'm the trajectory engineer, so I'm responsible for publishing the launch period. So how do we calculate the launch period? The time of launch is driven by the RAN, R-A-A-N, right ascension of the ascending node. The RAN is essentially a sun relative angle that the spacecraft requires us to achieve at spacecraft separation. So once we have the trajectory designed, the knob that we have to turn is the launch time. So we set the launch time to achieve the correct RAN. But then if you stop there, you have an instantaneous launch period. We want as long a launch period as possible to give us the best chances of launching on any given day. For L-44, we have a nearly five hour launch period. So how do we get there? Trajectory design incrementally steps out the trajectory until we reach the window open and window close time. That duration defines the launch period. Now these edge trajectories, they need to steer more and use more performance than the window optimal case in order to achieve the same orbit targets. We load specific guidance and navigation parameters depending on when we launch within the launch period so that robust guidance algorithms can get us to the correct orbit no matter when we launch within the launch period. This is just another factor of how the Delta IV Heavy can support the L-44 payload. Personally, I've been working on the L-44 mission for almost four years now, so I'm very excited to see all of our hard work come to fruition when it lifts off into the night sky. But more importantly, I'm looking forward to this vital asset to get on orbit and begin supporting 
the U.S. intelligence community, supporting national security space, and keeping Americans safe. As I mentioned at the opening of the broadcast, the team is working one issue. They're analyzing a uh, temperature in one of the vehicle compartments, and so we are going to be extending this built-in hold until we have further information. As they do for every mission, the NRO provided unique artwork for NRO 44. Here's the story behind the art. The background of this artwork is a dark shade of NRO blue to symbolize cross-organization collaboration required for mission success. In the foreground, we see a wolf howling as a warning to its pack as the first point of detection for signs of trouble. The wolf pack represents the nation and the international community leveraging and supporting the steadfast sentry. Lastly, the falling snow represents the purity of the NRO's intentions and the serene calm of peace. A few moments ago, Mission Director Colonel Chad Davis remembered our friends and colleagues, Chuck Mitchell and Winnie Pang. Let's listen in. This morning's NRO L-44 launch is dedicated to the memory of Chuck Mitchell and Winnie Pang. Chuck and Winnie have dedicated countless hours of technical expertise, ensuring the incredible success of a multitude of launches. Their warm smiles, team spirit, and phenomenal leadership have rippled across the aerospace and launch communities. To our fellow patriots, rest in peace. LC on one, AC. Oh, I see. Okay, we have yet another ECS adjustment for you. This is for the inner tank. Currently at 70 degrees F. We want to take that to 80 degrees F. Roger. ECS, LC. Go. Please take inner tank from 70 degrees Fahrenheit to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Roger.
This is Delta Mission Control at T-minus four minutes and holding. We remain in the planned built in 15 minute built in hold as preparations for launch continue. The team is still working through the temperature issue I mentioned earlier, and we'll get back to you with a new T0 as soon as we have one. As I mentioned earlier, today's launch is ULA's 29th for the NRO. While we stand by and wait for that new T0, let's take a look at the huge role the NRO plays in the security of our country. T minus three, two, one, zero. Ignition. We are the agency that made the impossible possible, protected the world, and brought technology to levels undreamt of. The race to space was a series of firsts, and we were there. We were the first to surveil our adversaries from the high ground of space, literally taking technology to new heights, watching our adversaries, guarding against the threat of nuclear war and providing strategic advantage to our nation. We were the agency no one had heard of because we worked in total secrecy. But we've stepped out of the shadows and we are writing the next chapters of American space technology. We are the National Reconnaissance Office, the NRO. 
the world leader in our tradecraft, collecting top secret imagery and signals from space. Natural disasters threaten thousands of lives. Conflicts displace millions, and adversaries mount threats. We give advance warning, aid in the aftermath, protect our citizens, and safeguard the world. We are the only agency that develops these tools, partnering with the intelligence community, the military, and the best of private industry to drive innovation. We are the leader in space intelligence systems, the NRO. At the heart of it, our people, people who take satellites from idea to orbit, focusing talent and resources, developing, building, launching, operating, sophisticated NRO systems that help us maintain global vigilance 24-7, 365. Small sets made possible by miniaturization, reducing costs and expanding possibilities. Large satellites with capabilities designed to answer our toughest national security questions. Pioneering achievements on the ground where analysts bring it all together. How do we do it? By investing in the latest research and development, using augmentation, automation, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Employing acquisition strategies to encourage competition. Enabling us to work with the industry's best and brightest. Like-minded people committed to technology without limits. This is where careers rise to heights unimagined, where you can take your eyes and ears into space. We deliver, under budget and on schedule, meeting and exceeding expectations, to answer questions yet unasked. We develop new technologies every day and put them to use in record time in the high ground of space. No one can match us the National Reconnaissance Office, the world leader in intelligence gathering. We are the NRO. While the team continues to evaluate the issue and evaluate our new potential T-zeros, one of the other items that the uh, team will be reviewing is data from the wind balloons that are launched here from here at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Data from these balloons are used to generate a steering profile for the first 115,000 feet of flight. These balloons provide data on wind, temperatures, etc. that we use to design the pitch, yaw, and roll steering profile for early ascent. This steering profile is loaded onto the flight computer 30 minutes before launch. It can be updated within the launch period if our launch time is delayed. We have this capability on all configurations of our vehicles because it allows us to minimize the effects of wind shear, which reduce dynamic loads on the vehicle and spacecraft and provides for more launch availability during periods of strong upper level winds.
minutes and holding. We continue to stand by for a new T0 while the team evaluates a thermal issue on the vehicle. While we do that, we'll take some additional views of the vehicle on the launch pad. There you can see the Delta logo with the number in the middle. The Delta rocket program has a long-standing tradition of noting the number of vehicles launched, beginning from the very first Delta rocket in 1960. The launch of NROL-44 will mark the 385th launch of a Delta rocket. Delta rockets have launched many of the world's vital space assets. Let's take a look at the impressive legacy of the Delta family of rockets. Though first launched in 1960, Delta's story really begins in the mid-1950s with the development of the Thor Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile. Named after the Norse god of thunder, Thor was created in response to a growing fear that the Soviet Union would beat the U.S. in the deployment of a long-range ballistic missile. The goal was to design a system that could deliver a nuclear warhead to a target 2,300 miles away, the distance between the United Kingdom and Moscow. On January 25, 1957, the first Thor lifted off from the newly constructed Space Launch Complex 17 at Cape Canaveral. Following a series of early failures, the Thor team celebrated their first success on September 20, 1957. In all, 59 Thor IRBMs were launched, with the last flight occurring in 1975. Thor began the transition from missile to space launch vehicle in 1958. On October 11, 1958, America's newly formed space agency marked its inaugural launch when Thor Able boosted NASA's Pioneer 1 on a mission to the moon, and NASA's long partnership with Thor was born. NASA and the Douglas Aircraft Company began development of the fourth and longest lasting Thor configuration in April 1959. Using a Thor first stage and a Vanguard second and third stage, Delta I lifted off on May 13, 1960 from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 17. Though its first launch was not successful, the Delta team quickly pinpointed the failure. Three months later, delivered NASA's Echo 1 communication satellite to orbit. Following Echo 1, the Delta team racked up an impressive 22 successful launches. Led by Bill Schindler, the Delta rocket earned its industry workhorse moniker for rapidly establishing itself as one of the most reliable and versatile launchers. During the 1960s, Delta launch vehicles paved the way for the burgeoning communications industry, launched America's first weather satellites, and sent probes to explore our universe. AT&T's Telstar-1, the first commercial communication satellite, launched in 1962, and in 1963, SYNCOM-2 became the world's first geosynchronous satellite. TIROS, or Television Infrared Observation Satellites, provided the National Weather Service with humans' first view of the Earth's cloud cover. In orbit around the Earth, Moon, and Sun, NASA's Explorer satellites provided us with a deeper understanding of the solar wind, cosmic rays, as well as Earth's magnetic field and radiation belts. By the end of the decade, launch vehicle modifications, including the addition of solid rocket motors and an upgraded third stage, made it possible for Delta to orbit satellites 10 times larger. The 1970s was an international decade for Delta, as the manifest included scientific and communication satellites for several countries across North America, Europe, and Asia. Perhaps the most demanding challenge of the 1970s was the launch of the Earth Imaging Earth Resources Technology Satellite, later known as Landsat. The mission for the Earth Sciences community required major changes to the Delta propulsion and guidance systems. During the 1980s, Delta continued its reliable service to the communications, weather, and Earth imaging communities. As capable as the Delta rocket proved to be, Production came to a halt in the early 80s, when national space policy dictated that the space shuttle be used as the U.S.'s primary launcher, signaling the end of the expendable launch vehicle. But in 1987, the Delta team picked up where they left off, and development began on a launch vehicle to support the Air Force's global positioning system. On February 14, 1989, 
Delta 184 began a new chapter in space launch history as it lifted off from Space Launch Complex 17. Demonstrating an incredible feat, the Delta II had gone from development to launch in just two years. To accommodate the larger GPS satellites, engineers improved the Delta rocket in several ways. The fuel tanks were stretched, a new payload fairing was developed, and larger solid rocket motors were incorporated. The modifications resulted in increased performance and flexibility. By the mid-1990s, the Delta II had delivered the fully operational 24-satellite GPS constellation. And though it was developed for the Air Force, Delta again became a reliable partner to both NASA and its commercial customers. Over the course of its more than 20-year run, the Delta II has launched some of America's best-known scientific and exploration missions. Plus four, three, two, we have main engine start. Zero and liftoff of the Stardust spacecraft. Liftoff of the Delta II rocket carrying the spirit from Earth to planet Mars. Liftoff of the Delta II with Grail. Journey to the center of the moon. On the commercial side, Delta II launched the Global Star and Iridium constellations, which brought satellite telephone communication to the world. Continuing its evolution to meet the growing demands of its satellite customers, the Delta team developed the more powerful Delta III. Though short-lived, the Delta III doubled the performance of the Delta II. An ignition, an ignition and liftoff of the Boeing Delta III rocket. Stage systems looking normal. Engine burners keep burning normally in all six rounds. In partnership with the Air Force's evolved expendable launch vehicle program, the Delta team began development of the next generation Delta rocket in the mid 1990s. And we have liftoff of the first no, Boeing yeah. Delta IV rocket yeah. carrying the W 5 telecommunications satellite for Eutelsat of France. All Delta IV configurations begin with the common booster core powered by the RS 68A main engine. The Delta IV Heavy, with its three common booster cores, deliver our nation's largest missions to orbit. Liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy rocket, carrying the NROL-32 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. Delta IV launch vehicles are produced at a 1.5 million square foot state-of-the-art facility in Decatur, Alabama. Processing and launch takes place at Space Launch Complex 37 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Space Launch Complex 6 at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Range safety arm light on. Right. Affirmative. Range ready. Ready. Water system ready. From its early beginnings as a weapon and deterrent through its transformation into a space launch vehicle, Delta has reliably supported our nation for more than 60 years. Delta's legacy as a workhorse continues today and is a testament to the persistence, dedication, and commitment an enterprising team that has continually evolved the Delta rocket to support a changing world. Five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy rocket.
This is Delta Launch Control at T minus four minutes and holding. The team continues to work through a lower than expected temperature condition in one of the vehicle compartments and has not selected a new T0 at this time. No matter when we lift off within the launch window, the trajectory is fixed through payload fairing jettison. A fixed ascent profile makes the range safety analysis more straightforward because areas that are clear do not have to change if the launch times move within the launch window. Robust guidance algorithms make corrections later in the mission in order to achieve the target spacecraft orbit. These guidance algorithms account for all the mission constraints, which could be structural or thermal, for instance how long the spacecraft spins in the sun, and adjust the duration of each of the three main engine burns to ensure that the spacecraft arrive, arrives where our customer wants it on time.
This is Delta Launch Control at T minus four minutes and holding. The team continues to work through a thermal observation in one of the vehicle compartments that does not match pre launch predictions. And we are awaiting a new T zero. Whenever we have issues like this come up, the Anomaly Chief, who you will uh, hear polled in the final countdown, will form a team uh, comprised of uh, ULA engineers, both here at the launch site and, um, if required, uh, back at our design center in Denver, Colorado, to uh, talk through the issue. As part of that team, the uh, United States Space Force uh, has engineers represented in that conversation as well. And if it's an issue that comes up and uh, could potentially impact our spacecraft, the spacecraft team is invited to participate in that discussion also. During that discussion, the team will uh, work through uh, current observations and uh, potential troubleshooting steps if required. Uh, the entire team will uh, concur on a go-forward plan that will allow the uh, launch to proceed or provide additional data with respect to the uh, given condition. And uh, once the entire team agrees, the uh, team will uh, either proceed with account or proceed with troubleshooting as prescribed by the Anomaly team. Once the issue is resolved, the Anomaly chief will come to Net1 and provide an outbrief to the launch director and the mission director and the launch conductor indicating that the the condition has been resolved and uh, operations can proceed for, for launch. So we'll continue to stand by while the team talks through the, the uh, thermal concern and we'll um, provide updates as they are available. Go, LD. LC, at this time, please load new target set, segment Bravo. Roger. Flight control, LC, net one. This is flight control. First step, 1450. Load contingency trajectory using auto file FPCS D uh, Delta Victor 041-002 underscore Charlie Alpha Sierra Echo underscore Bravo and revised guidance SDLC-RC is 5 Delta Charlie 8. Roger. And work. This is Delta Launch Control at T minus four minutes and holding. As you just heard, the launch conductor gave the uh, order after direction from the launch director to update our um, some of our guidance parameters. We spoke about that earlier in the uh, feature with uh, trajectory engineer Corey Buckingham. As we proceed through our launch window, at uh, there are certain points that we will reload new guidance parameters, ensure that we have an optimal flight to the spacecraft's target orbit. LC flight control. Go flight control. Contingency trajectory has been loaded using autofile FPCS 
dash Delta Victor zero four one dash zero zero two dash K underscore Bravo with the revised guidance STLCRC of five Delta Charlie eight. Roger. This is Delta Launch Control at T-minus four minutes and holding. The team continues to work through the thermal issue I mentioned earlier. So while we're um, waiting on that, we'll take you through some additional shots of Launch Complex 37. This is a wide angle shot. On the uh, left hand side of the screen, you can see the fixed umbilical tower with the three swing arms reaching over to the Delta IV heavy vehicle. Uh, in the background, uh, you'll see a flame. That is a hydrogen flare stack, so uh, gaseous hydrogen that uh, uh, is you basically evaporating from the liquid state, gets burned off through that hydrogen flare stack. Uh, it's actually quite a, quite a bit of distance away from the uh, launch vehicle, so even though you're uh, on your screen, it may look very close to the launch vehicle, there's actually quite a bit of distance there. And then off to the right side of the screen is the uh, mobile service tower I mentioned earlier. Here's a view of one of the Delta's onboard cameras. This camera is on the second stage looking down.
And here's a closer view of the launch pad and the swing arms. Uh, on the opposite side of the vehicle, you can see a gaseous liquid oxygen as it's uh, escaping out the oxygen vents. At this point in the count, the um, liquid oxygen will be replenished as uh, liquid oxygen evaporates into the gaseous format and comes out those vents as you see there on the first stage. This is Delta Launch Control at T minus four minutes in holding. We continue to evaluate the thermal issue on the first stage of the vehicle and are standing by for a new T0. We've created a short tour of our launch locations here at Cape Canaveral in Florida. Let's take a look around. With missions launched to every planet in the solar system, as well as critical national security, science, weather and communication satellites, ULA has established a long-standing reputation for reliability and orbit accuracy in the space launch industry. At our launch site in Cape Canaveral, Florida, the story begins with ULA's Atlas and Delta rockets arriving on the RS rocket ship. The rocket ship is a specially designed cargo ship used to transport rockets from ULA's 1.6 million square foot production facility in Decatur, Alabama. Rocket ship is large enough to carry a complete Delta IV heavy rocket. That's three boosters a second stage, and a payload fairing. Once loaded, rocket ship departs ULA's dock and travels through the Tennessee River, then onto the Ohio and Mississippi Rivers, then goes out into the Gulf of Mexico. From there, the ship travels through the Atlantic Ocean, around the southern tip of Florida, and north to Port Canaveral. Rocket ship was designed with several features to ensure successful delivery including the ability to adjust its draft for shallow water and rudderless steering, which minimizes the need to tug. Atlas V boosters are transported from the ship to the high bay in the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center, or ASOC, for final preparations. Delta IV boosters are moved to the Horizontal Integration Facility, or HIF, where they are mated together to form the Delta IV heavy configuration. With final checks completed, the boosters are transported to the launch pad for Launch Vehicle on Stand, or LVOS. 
the 107-foot-long Atlas V boosters are brought to Space Launch Complex 41 and are hoisted into a vertical position using a crane and placed under the Mobile Launch Platform, or MLP, in the Vertical Integration Facility, or VIF. Delta IV heavy rockets are raised vertically by a fixed-pad erector at Space Launch Complex 37. The fixed-pad erector uses a single hydraulic piston to rotate the boosters 90 degrees inside the Mobile Service Tower, or MST. LVOS is followed by the addition of solid rocket boosters, and then the second stage. Next comes Wet Dress Rehearsal, or WDR, which is an end-to-end -end launch simulation from fueling through spacecraft separation. Meanwhile, the ULA team is also working simultaneously to help the customer encapsulate their payload into the rocket's payload fairing. The encapsulated payload fairing is the final piece to be mated to the rocket. With the rocket stack complete, the spacecraft team tests all of the interfaces with the rocket and the launch pad. Once the rockets are completely assembled, final launch preps begin. For Atlas V rockets, launch countdown begins with moving the rocket from the VIF to the pad. The quarter-mile trip uses six components to complete the 20-minute trip. Weighing in at about 2 million pounds, the MLP supports the rocket and contains air conditioning, electrical, and commodities, while the undercarriages bear the weight of the MLP and rocket. Two rail cars lead the move, with the payload van providing communication to the payload, while the ground van houses the ground support for the rocket. At the rear of the convoy, the portable environmental control system provides air conditioning to the payload and rocket. Finally, Track mobiles provide the power to move the 3.5 million pound convoy. For Delta IV heavy rockets, the process looks quite different. Approximately nine hours before T0, final preparations begin as 40 hydraulic cylinders at pressures nearing 3,500 psi move the 10 million pound MST. It's first raised eight inches and then rolled back. Delta uses a carriage transporter system, traveling at about a quarter mile per hour. It takes about 25 minutes to roll the MST to its launch position, 345 feet north of the Delta IV rocket. The Delta IV rocket stands 217 feet tall, or about 21 stories, and weighs more than 900,000 pounds fully fueled. On the day of launch, nearly 30 engineers and managers are polled for system status and readiness to proceed. Status check to proceed with terminal count, Atlas systems, propulsion. This is the final status Go. check before Go. launch for all Go. Atlas and Delta Go. vehicle systems, Go. ground Go. systems, the spacecraft, Go. and the U.S. Air Go. Force Eastern Go. Range. Propulsion. The vehicle system Go. readiness Go. poll Pneumatic. includes electrical Go. systems, Go. hydraulics, Go. pneumatics, Go. propulsion systems, Go. flight Anomaly control, G. and propellers. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. Launch vehicle is ready to launch. Mission director. This is the mission director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. If the rocket is ready for flight and the weather is within the launch commit criteria, then polling will be completed and the team will have given the go for launch. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. There's ignition and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket. For a typical Atlas V flight, the main engine and solid rocket boosters ignite to lift the rocket off the pad. Shortly after liftoff, the rocket begins a pitchover to attain the proper flight path, minimizing the dynamic pressure the vehicle experiences during flight. Within the first few minutes of flight, the vehicle reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound, followed by jettison of the solid rocket boosters. About four minutes later, Propellant levels deplete and the booster engine shuts down, followed by release of the booster stage. At various times in flight, depending on the mission, the vehicle jettisons its payload fairing. From there, the second stage will continue carrying the spacecraft towards its destination with planned engine starts and stops. Finally, Centaur will release the spacecraft in its target orbit to continue its journey.
LCN one this is AC. Go AC. I'm ready to uh, brief the concerns for the OCU temp. Roger. LD net one. LD. MD net one. MD. Proceed AC. Okay, the team did uh, some very thorough uh, reviews and uh, ran uh, some models. Uh, based on uh, that and uh, our analysis, uh, we have uh, a conservative uh, prediction from the models, and uh, it generated efficient margin. Plus, uh, looking at uh, our flight trajectory will be mainly in, in sunlight, so that helps the situation as is. Um, our recommendation is to proceed that uh, we have uh, no uh, uh, concerns with uh, these current temps in the OC. LC concurs. LD? LD concurs. MD? MD concurs. This is Delta Launch Control at T-minus four minutes and holding. As you just heard, the Anomaly Chief provided an outbrief on that anomaly with uh, concurrence from the Launch Conductor, Launch Director, and Mission Director. So in just a short few moments, we'd expect to be hearing a new T-0 from the leadership team. So we'll stand by. LC, LD channel one. Go, LD. LC, please coordinate a new T0 of 07 colon 28 colon 00 Zulu. Roger, 0728 00 Zulu. Good copy. ALC, please set the clock for a T0 072800. Roger. RC, LC. RC. Please coordinate with the range, new T0 072800. 072800 Zulu in work. This is Delta Launch Control at T minus four minutes and holding. As you just heard, the launch team is now going to target a new T zero of three twenty eight AM Eastern Time. The assistant launch conductor will reset the countdown clocks for the new T-0 while the range coordinator goes to the eastern range and verifies eastern range can support that new T-0. LC, RC, 1. Go. Range is approved, new T-0, 07-2800. Roger. LC, LC. Go. Countdown clock has been set for a new T-0 of 07-28. We're currently at L-24 minutes. Roger. All right, team, the uh, clocks are set, and uh, we have an approved T0 0728 to low. This is Delta Launch Control at T minus four minutes and holding. As you just heard, the new T0 has been approved, the clocks are reset, and the clocks are now counting down towards a new T0 of 328 a.m. Eastern Time.
L minus 23 minutes. This is Delta Launch Control at T minus four minutes and holding. As you can see on your screen, this is a view from the Launch Control Center at the Delta Operations Center. The team in the LCC is responsible for the final pre-launch checkouts, fueling, and launch of the Delta IV Heavy Vehicle. This is the Mission Director Center, or MDC. Uh, within the MDC, you'll find the ULA Launch Director and the NRO Mission Director, who you just heard as they received an out brief on the uh, anomaly we've been working and then provided direction on that new T0. Here's a view from our DOSC, the Denver Operations Support Center. Uh, these in, are uh, engineers that are uh, responsible for uh, the design and uh, operation of the various subsystems on the vehicle. Uh, these engineers would have been engaged in the anomaly discussions uh, and uh, in the analysis that you heard referenced as the anomaly chief provided the outbrief on that uh, anomaly we worked a few minutes ago. L minus 21 minutes. This is Delta Launch Control at T minus four minutes and holding. As you heard a few moments ago, the range coordinator went to the Eastern Range to request approval for a new T0. ULA collaborates with the Eastern Range to prevent launching at a time that would result in the vehicle colliding with the ISS, another satellite, or catalog space debris. Our trajectories in the launch window are provided to the Space Force for analysis prior to launch day, and we're given a report several hours before launch that indicates if launch on a given minute within the window, we'll have the rocket or payload flying near an object with a high probability of contact. This report is called a COLA report, which is short for Collision on Launch Avoidance Report. The mission director reviews the report and lets us know if there's a particular minute that we should not target for a T0. In this case, the targeted T0 was clear. Our T0 was approved, and we are counting down toward a launch at 3.28 a.m. Eastern Time.
Go. ULA provides the analysis used by the Eastern Range to produce stayout zones for airline pilots and boat captains on day of launch. These stayout zones prevent intentionally jettisoned rocket pieces from landing on airplanes and boats. The Eastern Range will produce notums or notices to airmen to indicate to pilots that the airspace around Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and along the launch vehicle's flight path should be avoided. In the event an aircraft enters this controlled airspace on launch day, local air traffic control will contact the aircraft and direct them out of the area. The range also produces notices to mariners to provide the same information to boaters. The U.S. Coast Guard will post these notices at local ports and boat ramps. United States Air Force, NASA, or U.S. Customs and Border Patrol aircraft or U.S. Coast Guard boats may intervene if boaters enter the controlled sea space and do not respond to attempts to communicate. This is Delta Launch Control, T-4 minutes and holding. L minus 14 minutes. As gas, LC. Go, LC. Establish scan pattern 140. Roger. VSE, LC, net one. VSE on one. Verify base bending moment instrumentation is active and data is valid. Verified active. Rep and placard 6 alpha for launch. Roger, 6 alpha. OS, LC. OS. Set BBM active. Roger.
I'll personnel check your mics on that one. L minus 12. MEQ, initiate retract data logger just prior to the L7 poll. Roger. I have an open mic on net one. L minus 11 minutes. SYS, configure flu mod for PU shadow mode. Roger. Flight control, configure option 910 for PU shadow mode. Roger. L minus 10 minutes. All communications switch to channel 1. All personnel and visitors remain in present position until launch. Maintain operational silence in the LCC. RC, verify solar radiation limits acceptable for launch. Verified. Terminal count briefing. If a condition exceeds a launch constraint any time after the terminal count status check, the observer shall announce hold, hold, hold on channel 1. Identify their station and briefly state the reason for the hold. Flight control, perform launch on time verification. Roger. OSM, verify the hold fire switch is in the proceed position. Ready to proceed. RLM, verify the red line monitor and vent table are in the correct configuration for terminal count. Verified. L minus nine minutes. This is LC performing hold authority comm check. L6RF? Loud and clear. Loud and clear as well. ATD? Loud and clear. Loud and clear as well. LC? Launch on time verified. Roger. LC, switch to the ready position. All steps are complete prior to the status check. L minus eight minutes. This is Delta Mission Control at T-minus four minutes and holding. We remain in the built-in hold as preparation for launch continues. In a few moments, launch conductor Scott Barney will poll the launch team for the final go to pick up the count. 27 engineers and managers are polled for system status and readiness to proceed. This is the final status check before launch for all Delta vehicle systems, ground systems, the spacecraft, and the U.S. Air Force Eastern Range. The vehicle system readiness poll includes electrical systems, hydraulics, pneumatics, propulsion systems, flight control, and propellants. Let's listen in as Scott Barney performs the final polling of the launch team.
Oh, yeah, minus seven minutes. Status check to proceed with terminal count. First aid systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Locks. Go. LH2. Go. Second stage systems, locks. Go. LH2. Go. Electrical systems, airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. Com. Go. GCQ. Go. Operation support. Go. Pneumatics. Go. Umbilicals. Go. Hasgas. Go. ECS. Go. Red line monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. Launch vehicles ready to launch. Mission director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. L minus six minutes. MEQ, establish swing arm lock pins pull. Active. Polling is complete and the launch team has given the go for launch. The countdown will resume approximately two minutes from now, but before it does, let's walk through the final checks we'll hear from the launch team. Delta IV's liquid oxygen and hydrogen tanks have been full for approximately a half hour and in topping mode to replenish commodities that evaporate while we perform final valve and vent system checks. Once the terminal count begins, you'll hear indications that propellant topping has halted on all Delta first and second stage tanks. The oxygen systems are secured first, followed by the hydrogen systems, and all tanks will be pressurized for flight. The vehicle will transfer from ground electrical power to its onboard batteries. Hydraulic systems are pressurized and the vehicle's ordnance systems are armed. At T-60 seconds, the eastern range will provide the range green call indicating that weather conditions are acceptable. All supporting assets are ready for liftoff and the air and sea adjacent to Complex 37 and along the flight path are clear. At T-30 seconds, Launch Conductor Scott Barney will conduct one final short status check to verify all systems remain go for launch. Terminal count. At T minus 15 seconds, the ROFIs or radial outward firing igniters will light to burn off residual hydrogen around the base of the vehicle. At T minus 7 seconds, the starboard engine will ignite, followed by the port and core engines at T minus 5 seconds, and liftoff will occur at T0. After liftoff, you'll hear the voice of Patrick Moore with launch vehicle ascent data. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes and holding. We anticipate releasing the hold in just a few moments. T minus four minutes. The countdown clock is resumed. We've entered the terminal count. Go for launch. Ground pyro is enabled. Minus 325. Second stage lock secure at flight level. Second stage liquid oxygen systems are now secured and ready for flight. Minus 307. That's 249. FTS internal. CBC locked at flight pressure and flight level. Vehicle now on internal power. First stage lock systems are secured for flight.
Minus two minutes. Hydraulic pressure at 4,000. Vehicle internal. 155. Launch sequence or start. CBC LH2 at flight pressure and flight level. Minus 140. FPS launch enabled. 137. FTS arm. T minus 90 seconds. The launch vehicle, payload, ground systems at eastern range are go for launch. Minus 120. OCUs armed. FCS count started. T minus one minute. Engine start, box go. Rock, report range status. Range green. Minus 50. Second stage LH2 secure at flight level. Minus 30. Status check. Go Delta. Go NROL 44. Fifteen. Rofi ignition. Ten. Nine. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Liftoff. And stand by. We've obviously had a hot fire abort. And LC uh, verifies Miko confirm. This is Delta Launch Control. The last call from the launch conductor indicating that he has confirmed that the engines did not start. At this point, the launch team will be securing the launch vehicle, ensuring that all systems are saved. Received a Tisser abort. Roger. And are you ready to reset the clock? T minus four and holding. Roger, ready. Roger. ALC, re reset countdown clock to T minus four minutes and holding. Roger. LC, FCS in pre-flight mode. Roger. Prop 1, verify safe RS-68 shutdown and follow the purge configuration. Active, sir. DST-1, LC. DST-1, best source select number 4 to switch best source select number 1 and Best act, source select number two, force to channel one. Roger. MEQ, swing arm lock pins install. In work.
And LC uh, pad looks nominal. OSM, can you verify? We're doing sweeps right now. Roger. I don't see, I don't see any fires. LC, lock pins installed. Roger. ALC, establish engine cooling water off. Water off. LCOSM. OSM. Sweep complete, no fires. Roger. And USO, you can verify same. USO verified. Roger. And MEQ, Elsie. Go ahead. Did you verify lock pins installed? Yes. Roger. All right. Report system status, fuel one. Fuel one nominal. Fuel two. Fuel two nominal. Locks one. Locks one nominal. Locks two. Locks two is nominal. And prop one. Uh, we're still looking, sir, but we uh, we think we're nominal at this time. Roger. Report one complete. Roger. And PNE, have you established PSN2? Verified. HYE, secure hydraulics. Roger. Has gas established scan pattern 305. Roger. GE, establish arm igniters, reset. Reset. PNE, verify nose cone purge on and set heater to 164 degrees. Verified. OSM, Elsie. OSM. Report ready to safe vehicle ordinance. Ready. And uh, verify OSM concurrent safe FTS. OSM concurs. FTS, command FTS safe and external. In work. This is Delta Launch Control. Uh, as you're hearing on the net, the team is working to secure and safe the vehicle. Um, swing arm lock pins have been installed to ensure the swing arms uh, will not, uh, not be retracted. And all vehicle systems are being uh, evaluated for their status. So far, all nominal calls from all of the uh, operators relative to their, their systems on the uh, ground and on the launch vehicle. MEQ, report swing arm system secured. Secured. ALC, on TC emergency pedal, remote cameras normal. Normal. PNA, configure helium supplies. In work. Uh, 
LC, flight control is ready to see the D taking. Roger. LD, LC, that one. LDL one. LD, we had a hot fire abort at T minus three seconds. We have performed our uh, abort sequence securing. We are ready to proceed into uh, detanking operations. Proceed, LC. All right, team, we're proceeding to Operation 80. And RC notify range uh, of decision. RC copies. Flight control terminate option 910 and reset 910 flags. Roger. And LC to 1-1 one, one able. Uh, LC go. Yes, sir, prop 1 finally can uh, state Systems nominal. Roger. Option 910 terminated and flag reset. Roger. And flight control re enable MSE Adams limit monitor. Roger. It's going to work. MSC limit monitors are enabled. Roger. RLM LC. RLM, go ahead. Stop red line monitor. Roger. LC flight control is ready for clock to reset to T plus five minutes and counting. Roger. ALC, adjust clock to T plus five minutes and start plus count. Roger. Pass gas, LC. LC, RLM. Go ahead. Uh, go RLM. RLM. RLM is stopped. Roger. Pass gas, um, proceed to scan pattern 305. Roger. And MEQ, we've already established swing arm lock pins installed. Roger. Uh, shut down swing arm hydraulic system. Roger. OSM LC. Awesome. First step 70, drop FHA roadblocks and establish BDA roadblocks. Roger. OSM SRM ignition disable. Just disabled. SYS LC. Go. Establish T4 PCM data transferred anomaly per data station PCM selection item. Roger. PNE LC. Go for PNE. Perform initial securing for step 70. Roger. MEA LC net one. Send me A, go ahead. Yeah, can uh, you verify FEVBS covers remain intact? Uh, yes, sir, they all are intact. All nine. 
I just want to repeat, all nine are inter intact. All nine are intact. Roger, thank you. FTS, LC. Go ahead. Step 90, secure RF, FTS, and GPS, MT. Roger. ABE, disable EIB heaters. Roger. LC, LD on channel one. Go, LD. LC, the MD has declared a scrub for today's operation. Please proceed with uh, detanking operations. Roger. This is Delta Mission Control. It's now been confirmed that Delta IV Heavy and ROL-44 launch activities will not continue this morning, and a new, date, a new date has yet to be identified. For the most up-to-date information, please visit ULALaunch.com, follow us at ULA Launch, or call 1-877-ULA-4321. This concludes this morning's coverage. I'm Dylan Rice. Thank you for joining us.